The Cold War began as a conflict centered in Europe with the United States and the Soviet Union anchoring alliances of democratic and communist states. Although separated by an iron curtain between East and West, it's still very much a conflict of two Western worlds. As the 1940s became the 50s and then the 60s, the Cold War becomes global. And this series of presentations will focus on its impact in Asia, starting with the country having one-fifth of the world's population China. Traditionally, China had always pictured itself as Cheng Kuo, the Middle Kingdom. From ancient times, they tended to view themselves as the center of the world. Separated by deserts and mountains from most of the rest of the world, they were able to live in relative geographic isolation, which ultimately would lead to cultural isolation as well. As you've learned earlier, this began to change in the 1800s, beginning what was known by some as the Century of Humiliation and Shame. During this time, Western imperialism raised its head through European and American outposts for trade in China. Later on, during the early 1900s, invasions by the Japanese Empire further served to downgrade China's position and power in the world. However, at the beginning of the century, the ancient and medieval dynasties had come to an end and China had started on the process of modernization. This was done by a republic established under Dr. Sun Yat-sen, who created a parliamentary system of government. With his death in 1925, this man, Zhang Jishi, took charge of the government of China and took it in a more nationalist direction towards the right on the political spectrum if you want to look at it this way. Not surprisingly, every action having an equal and opposite reaction, a communist movement also rose up in China headed up by this man, Mao Zedong. Immediately the two sides went into a long period of civil war which went badly for the communists and Mao at first, where in 1934 and 35 Mao's communist forces literally had to march hundreds of miles into the mountains to be out of the reach of Zhang's nationalist government. The two sides are going to eventually form a truce during World War II, uniting to fight against the Japanese Empire. However, after the World War II, they went right back into civil war mode and by 1949 Mao takes control of the mainland which he renames the People's Republic of China Jiang and his government escaped to the island of Taiwan where they established the Republic of China thus by 1949 combining the United the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics and China you had up to one-third of the world's population living under communist rule. During the Cold War itself, China was very much a wild card in terms of the game of politics between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. During the 1950s, not surprisingly, Mao lined up with Stalin and the Soviet Union. He provided support for North Korea in the Korean War, which we'll look at in another screencast, and Chinese troops ended up fighting against American and United Nations troops in that same conflict. However, in the 1960s, the Soviet-Chinese relationship began to break down and break off, as Mao was looking to expand China's authority beyond that of the Soviet Union. In the 1970s, Mao began to play what's known as the China card. By opening up to overtures from the United States government, eventually leading to the People's Republic being recognized in the United Nations and President Nixon visiting China, they become more of a power on the world stage. And effectively, uh, China uses its relationship with the United States to play off the Soviet Union and vice versa. Truly a wild card. At home, Mao more or less became an idol. We've talked about totalitarian states in the past as representing a cult of personality, 
and certainly that was true in Mao's case. Uh, he became the red sun of the heart of many of the Chinese people. However, if you go back and look at his record within his own country, it doesn't show quite a sunny an outlook. For example, in 1958, nine years after taking power, Mao instituted what was known as the Great Leap Forward. This was an attempt to reform Chinese industry and agriculture by effectively collectivizing all of China's land and labor with the goal of doubling food production in the course of a year as well as doubling the production of steel leading to not only collectivization of land and labor on farms but also creating in effect backyard industries what look like little pots or urns here are actually little miniature steel mills where Chinese people took their cooking pots their scrap metal anything that could be melted down and attempted to turn it into steel it's extremely ambitious but it proves to be extreme disaster the Great Leap fails for a number of reasons first because it was made from poor raw materials to begin with the steel that's produced is by and large unusable and therefore the energy that goes into its production was effectively wasted unfortunately by wasting that time on producing poor unusable steel farming was also neglected because there's no incentive for individual farmers and every incentive to cook the books communes deliberately reported false numbers in terms of their actual production so the effort that was supposed to double food production within a year ended up creating massive food shortages instead ironically the great leap forward to doubling food production ultimately led to a two-year period in which as many as 55 million people died of malnutrition or starvation this obviously causes Mao to take a major hit to his reputation after laying low for a few years he attempts to reestablish himself with something called the Cultural Revolution claiming that communism in China was under attack from what he called bourgeois elements capitalism materialism and social classes he went on an all-out propaganda campaign to recruit soldiers peasants factory workers and most importantly students to create what he called a dictatorship of the proletariat in which the working classes were supposed to take over the concept was to smash the old world as this poster says and establish a new world destroy the four olds trash old culture old customs old ideas and old habits ultimately what the Great Leap did was create a circumstance in which all the old power structure was constantly being challenged and threatened with one notable exception Mao himself during the re revolution quotations from his various speeches and writings were collected into what became known as the little red book and during the cultural revolution anyone caught without carrying the little red book on their person could end up being punished not just legally or economically but potentially physically as well it was a time very much like the reign of terror in the old French Revolution in which in this case millions of people ended up being exiled jailed and even killed for being opposed to what amounted to the cult of Mao it's something that's not going to end until Mao himself dies in 1976 following Mao's death China began and what they're still continuing today as one of the more interesting and remarkable transformations of recent history Mao's successor Deng Xiaoping immediately sent most of Mao's followers to prison and then proceeded to reform the economy of China 
rather than collectively try to create double agriculture and double industry he ends the he ended the system of communes allowing peasants to own their own land he also relaxed the restrictions on small businesses he allowed students to go to business schools outside of China and he encouraged Chinese investment in international industries and economic systems. As a result, China has become one of the world's superpowers in terms of economics. How long it's going to be able to maintain that status? A capitalist state while maintaining a communist government is going to be an interesting thing to see. In the meantime, the Cold War is going to have influence on other parts of Asia as well, and we'll be looking at that in our next screencast.